welcome to this Academy talk. One of the reasons, of course, we have the uh, uh, Critical Questions in Education Conference is to gather together and share ideas with one another. And another one of the reasons is to bring um, some people in our group to have, have us learn from them. And we are very, very pleased to have with us in this Academy talk uh, Professor Gary Borich from the University of Texas. Um, I'm guessing that most of you recognize that name. Um, go to your library shelves and look around and you're going to see Borich in there somewhere. Um, Gary is the Sissy McDaniel Parker Endowed Fellow and Professor of Educational Psychology at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, and he has some recent books out or reissues of previous texts that he has written. Uh, Fundamental Experimental Designs, Fundamentals of Statistical Inference, um, and the seventh edition of Effective Teaching Methods and the ninth edition of Educational Testing and Measurement, Classroom Applications and Practice. And Gary sent me another, uh, an email, uh, uh, an email with an attachment of something he's working on that has to do with constructivist education. And we're going to make sure that he tells us something about that before we let him go. Could you please join me in welcoming Gary Boric from the University. <laughs> Gary, um, I'm hearing up with some really tough questions. <laughs> no, no I, I'm, 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 I'm starting out with a softball. Okay, good. Okay. Ready for a softball question? <laughs> What's my name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, something a little, a little better than that, maybe. Uh, I'll just tell you this. Um, when we have put together these critical questions, I sometimes give criticism because the questions are yes or no answers. And sometimes they're not. Um, so the, the one question we asked are traditional teacher education programs uh, preparing quality teachers is a yes or no answer. The other one, having to do with assessment, how should we evaluate educators, is definitely not a yes or no question. But Gary, uh, you know, in either one of those areas, you know, I'll let you take your pick. Uh, and maybe if you want to start with the assessment, that's great. Your, your pick. Where are we now? Are, are you happy with where we are? in talking about how to assess teachers in the public discussion of them? Uh, or are you happy about the discussion about teacher education programs? Or do you have some worries, and if you do, what are they? Uh, when you first uh, asked me to come here, I was going to write back and said, no, I don't think I'm the right person for you, because I don't have the yes or no answer. <laughs> uh, and, 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 I, and I also, yeah, right. I said, well, the assessment one, okay, I might be able to answer that one. Uh, no, I'm, I'm troubled about where we are in teacher education. I've been in the field for, goodness, 40 years. Uh, I've observed in a lot of classrooms. Uh, basically, I'm an evaluation person in the sense that I'm really concerned about what we're doing in education does it work. Uh, there's a lot of activity and changes in education and new models of education and so forth. But uh, my history is, uh, uh, my first job was really a, a dream job. I graduated from Indiana University. Uh, There's some really good uh, teacher educators there that taught me a whole lot. I kind of grew up with Jeremy Brophy, you know, there they are, and Tom Wood, and, um, Dave Berliner, and, uh, all the greats uh, last decade or two. Learned a lot from them. Well, the, the University of Texas had the, uh, you don't have them now, unfortunately, but the Research and Development Center for Teacher Education funded by the federal government. Uh, and uh, we were very well funded. Uh, we had $5 billion a year, and that day, that was a lot of money. Okay. Uh, and that continued for about 10 or 15 years. So my first job, uh, when I, I wanted to, when I graduated from Indiana, was to go there. Uh, and I worked hard talking to people, so I really want to be there because that's where the action was because that center was set up to develop innovative teacher training programs and to evaluate those programs. And there couldn't have been two things I was more interested in my life. Uh, and I said, that's where I want to be, and I worked, that's when Jerry Dolphy and others were there, and then I wanted to learn from them. And so I spent uh, about 10 years at that center uh, at the University of Texas. Still there. Uh, ultimately, that center went 
to uh, Michigan State University. But that was a very important part of my life and, and learning. Uh, our job was to look across the country for programs that were out of the ordinary, innovative, they would say, uh, that was trying to do some things and be more effective than just your run of the mill way in which we train teachers and colleges and education. And uh, my job was to study those programs and evaluate the effectiveness of those programs and we even designed some of those programs at the University of Texas and then highly tested them across the, the country. So I got a good sense of what education was all about. Uh, and I thought I knew probably everything I needed to know, but as time went on, uh, I became uh, concerned about the way in which teacher education was changing, and one of the ways was the, the implication of, of the testing movement. Not that uh, there's anything wrong with testing. We've always tested it in one way or another. But it seemed like there was such exclusivity in terms of you know, how you evaluate the teacher training programs, and I certainly uh, in kind of growing up with teacher education when I was at the Research and Development Center for Teacher Education, looked at teaching in a much broader, more continuous way. Uh, we certainly looked at standardized test scores uh, and performance at the end of the teacher training and in the classroom. But what we did is, is what we seem to have lost somewhat in our teacher education research today, and that is looking at the process of what the teacher actually does in the classroom to generate those scores. Uh, today, the emphasis is on the scores. And in fact, the lives of teachers are affected by that. Some get pay raises, some don't, and so forth. Uh, those scores, quite frankly, uh, go up and down for a lot of reasons, other than what goes on in the classroom. I mean, to be sure, they should be related to, to teacher training and what the teacher does. And, and they are, but it's not the be-all and end-all of it. I think what bothered me the most was that you can't, you don't know what to change when you just look at the end of the teaching, the, the, the final test, the standardized tests. Uh, uh, it's nice you know okay, whether kids are learning at a certain level or not, but how do you go back and work with the teacher? That's what I'm interested in. How do you train the teacher now to do something better? What if you don't have any idea? It's the test score, it's how the kids perform not how the teacher's performing. So my emphasis has been in looking at the process of what the teacher actually does to change those scores and, and how do we teach the teacher in order to change those scores. That's the emphasis I found missing. And then uh, finally, beginning in the late 1980s, 1990s, I said, we know enough about effective teaching from all of the research that what, is, what are these processes? Uh, that the teacher can use. And then we wrote a book that's the one you just cited, the seventh edition, which is now the eighth edition of Effective Teaching Methods. And the next part of that title, colon, Research Based Practice. I looked into all of the research, so anything in that book, I said, hey, uh, this isn't just, uh, you know, I think this works, or these people said it works, where there was really hard evidence. Uh, so the research based practice meant okay, what were the dimensions of effective teaching? And that, that book, not to simplify it too much, but there are eight or nine things and some things which you can do that was also supported by research. So basically, uh, uh, now we're up into you know, 2000, 2010, uh, 2013, going on 14. I find that most of the research that's being done is focused on those standardized scores. And I don't see enough emphasis on trying to find out what teachers are doing in the classroom that we could come back, help them with change, to change those scores. One is I'm a little bit worried about the link between teacher behavior and the standardized test scores. I mean, a lot, a lot of it has to be the kid himself or herself. Uh, uh, but what are, what, what is good teaching? Uh, and what's indirect and direct teaching? What are the different styles? When do you use one? Uh, versus the other. We've got a lot of evidence on all of that information. So basically, my recent consumption is, the time where I spend my time, is thinking about the measures of, that are, I would call process measures, of what the teacher does in the classroom. We do very little, really serious observation of teachers in the classroom. I know some of you are mostly today in the teacher training program, most of you. Uh, but what I mean here is that you, you study
study your teachers on a consistent basis of what happens to them, what they do, uh, and that's a built-in part of the teacher training program. So in other words, research that says that these things are going to improve standardized testing, test scores, but they'll do much more than that. They'll teach them methods of teaching and so forth. They'll last much further on. Well, that's a kind of a long answer to that, that one question, but we can come back to it. So that's a little bit about my name. Um, well, it's, it's a short answer to what's a really complicated question. Yeah. Sure. Um, do you think that there are ways for us to get back to the kind of research that you have wanted to do since the, the very beginning? Or are we being urged as teacher educators and as teachers in the classroom and as teacher education students to lay aside your essential worries, the things that you want us to think about in favor of some of these other things? Can we even get back to where you want us to go? Uh, I, think, I think so, because I think in a way we're already there. I mean, even at this conference, uh, the notion of this uh, link between the teacher behavior and the standardized achievement score has come up a number of times. So I think it's on all of our minds. It's the development of the tools and the techniques actually to use in the classroom that are practical, uh, that are research-based, and we do have a lot of those. I mean, I think at least one group or two here uses like book observation skills for effective teaching. Uh, that book was intended for people like yourselves or uh, teachers in the classroom themselves or their supervisors to see whether those things in the classroom that can be supported by research were actually happening. And if not, here's the way in which you can get teachers to do these kinds of things because they're going to be related to good things. And the, the students are going to change their affect, they're going to change their thinking skills, they're going to change their test scores. So um, I think uh, it's not really a pessimistic story for me. I think it's just more of getting out there, providing more assessment and guidance for individual on how to look at the link between what that teacher does in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis in ways that can promote student achievement and other kinds of student behavior that you want, such as high order thinking and uh, conceptualization and so forth. So uh, we don't have a whole lot of federal money being spent in that direction. That's, that's one issue that made it uh, easier to do two, two or three decades ago. But I, I hope that it, it will come back. And, and a, lot of, a lot of times this, these can be local, local endeavors. I mean, I've heard of some people today, they already do these kinds of things. Uh, uh, but I think they can benefit from a research base that actually supports what they're doing. Is there enough motivation for the teacher to seriously engage his or her mind about these sorts of things when he or she is being told by principals to worry about student test scores yeah. and superintendents. And when merit pay is, is locked to it and employment possibilities or continuing employment possibilities are locked to these student test scores, why don't they just do test prep things instead of effective teaching things? Uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, disappointing things, I mean, I think that is in the idea of the professional learning community which are touted, uh, where teachers work with each other and work with school administrators. I think it's a great idea, but I was hoping that when that idea became so popular, that some of it would be devoted to working with, with teachers, the process part of it. I mean, it's, it's called professional learning community. Hey, uh, we're all teachers in this, this school, and here are our administrators, and here is the school system. It, it is a community. It should be, uh, and in some ways it does work as a community in some schools, but there's, that is a vehicle uh, to work on the assessment as well as the teacher preparation that are in service uh, or student teachers that now can make that link more research-based between what they do in the classroom and what you expect in terms of standardized tests. Our are politicians going to accept that kind of talk, Gary? You know, it, it, it all, it all kind of, uh, I interrupted you a little bit, but that's uh, right. you know, I, it comes down to the money. You know, it's effort. Where do you want to spend your time? Uh, I think there's some acculturation that needs to go on. Uh, I think the direction, you need both directions. You're obviously interested in some kind of assessment at the end of uh, 
kids grade and during the grades and uh, you know I have no problem with you know assessments. I just have a problem with the I think there should be equal emphasis on how the teacher actually gets to those particular scores. That's something that I think is very trainable. Now teacher training institutions do that. I mean they're about training them, okay. Uh, but in the evaluation part of it, which is the second part of the question, how do you assess whether they are doing it, either during their student teaching practice or when they're out on the job in the first and second and third year? And then, and then I come back to resources. You, you, somebody's got to come up with resources to do that. It's not an enormous amount, but you, you have to be devoted to it. I get the feeling that people are impatient with us, though, Gary. That, 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 that the principal looks at his or her staff and says, oh, this person is fine, this person is fine, well, this person is exceptional. I, I, I think we're accused of being a little light on how hard we want to be on one another. At, at calling things for the way they are, for, for pushing teachers to improve. That we have that we've somehow become soft and that, that people are going to, in the name of accountability, urge us and push us to clean up our profession. That's what I, that, that, that's what I tend to, to see from the, the, from the people that I, that I hear to on the, on, the, on the national stage. Politicians and, and, and Arnie Duncan. And I just don't think people trust us to clean up our own hands. Yeah, I think that's unfortunate. I mean, we have so many talented people that go into the field of education, which quite frankly, they can do a lot of other things in their life and in some ways make their life a lot easier. I mean, uh, you know, you know as well as I do, and I taught too, uh, that teaching is the hardest, hardest thing I've ever done. You know, I really, really is emotionally drained, uh, intellectually challenging. So I think the idea that you know people need something cleaned up alone is kind of a mis misperception. Uh, uh, I think most uh, most of us, most teachers, do a, uh, an excellent job. But again, I come back to two two issues. Uh, it's the uh, it's the observation of a teacher. And those of you who are in teacher training programs. Uh, the observation of teachers in their first teaching experience is the most critical time of all. Uh, if you don't get it then, it takes a heck of a lot more to change it after they're out in the real world. There, uh, for good reason, you're in a, a fairly rarefied existence right now. Uh, you're in a classroom, it is a real classroom, but you have a mentor. You may have a, a teacher that works with you. You've got a connection, a relationship with that person. Uh, now, if you had an agenda as what needed to go on during this student teaching experience and follow up afterwards, which we don't do very much, okay, and again, that's a money issue, we're going to pay you out there and you know, follow up uh, on it. Those are the two critical times in a teacher's life. It's during that student teaching experience and it's that first year on the job. And it's amazing uh, when I do valuations for various school districts because they ask, you know, how are we doing? And, uh, you know, they're pressured by the school board and a lot of reasons. We want some data to show we're doing a good job because we've got a bond issue with the, you know, we want more money you know, and so forth. But it, it is amazing that uh, when I go out, I interview the teachers that have gone through the program during their first year, uh, the kind of holes in the curriculum, so to speak, and it's not the teacher's fault, it's not the, the, the teacher educator's fault, it's the, the opportunity for people to put time and money into follow through. But I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, but, uh, we had an a innovative teacher training program at the University of Texas, and we created it out of whole growth claw, decided let's do the best techniques that were documented by research. Let's put it in this program. You know? uh, and build this program, and it's, let's on top of that, let's just let really bright people come into the program. That was a little bit artificial, in that sense, you know. They were going to take the best and brightest, you know, and see what we can do. So they ran through this program, this four-year program, required a lot of uh, 
extra courses. It required a lot of, as you could expect, of student teaching, uh, a lot of in-the-school activity, uh, a fairly rigorous curriculum that they took. Uh, and it was time to do at least part of the evaluation. Uh, and I'm not, I'm in the educational psychology department, um, and our teacher programs as most are in curriculum instruction. So they were wanted people to go out and interview the individuals that were in this program after three months on the job. This would be their first uh, teaching experience. Well, they were, I guess they ran out of people to go out and, you know, we had probably 45, 50 people in there, so their faculty was supposed to go. And they're spread all across the state, uh, some out, out of the state. Uh, and finally, they came to me and said, we don't have enough. Would you go down and uh, interview these three teachers that were in this program in Houston? Okay. Uh, I said, well, listen, I'm not in the program. You know, I you know, we can go down there. Okay. So I went down there, and I got these three teachers together who were all in the program that were in a high school in Houston. Uh, quite frankly, this is a, I don't know how you describe it, a rough and tough high school, okay? Uh, uh, and uh, when I walked in there, I said, I'm here to uh, ask some questions about your teacher training program. Uh, what was it like? You know, what did you like? And so forth. And they started to shout and yell at me, and I didn't expect it at all. They said, I said, what's the problem? They said, you didn't tell us. You didn't tell us these things. And I said, well, I'm not even a teacher. I tried to get out of here. <laughs> hey, I'm just a passive guy here, you know. And, that, and I, I told that, that phrase, you know, two or three times during this. And they just don't, they didn't hear me, you know. They just kept coming back. And they said, well, why did you? So I said, well, what's, what's, what's the problem? He said, well, we all have the same classroom management problem. And I said, and we, we, we study classroom management. Uh, we, we, we had a book on classroom management, we had lectures on it. I said, I said, well, what's the problem? And I said, well, you know, these kids are doing things we've never seen before, okay? <laughs> well, I said, well, uh, I did ask, where do you do your student teaching? Well, you may not call them Boston very well, but once they were Brown Rock and Westlake Hills, which is the up, upscale <laughs> schools in, in Austin, and now they're down in Houston, and I, and they, I, they said, well, we've got textbook. We called. We said we even called our professors and asked them for the conclusions to it uh, of how they could solve this and got no answers. They said that we, we, got, we got our books out. We studied our books and we looked at the books for it. You know, and they couldn't find it. What do you do when a kid says this to you? You know, um, and they said, and another kid, what do you do when a kid does this? And we couldn't find it anywhere in these books. You know, and I said, you know, and I said, you know, you were selected into, you know, this top-notch program at the University of Texas, Tauville, in the United States. Uh, you were especially, you know, uh, asked to come into the program. You're all bright people. I said, have you thought about, you know, that talked among yourselves of maybe coming up with some strategies as to how to deal with that? And they looked at me like the strangest thing in the world, you know, I said, well, it should be in some book. I said, well, no, I said, it doesn't work that way, you know. I said, what's in the book, you know, kind of gives you an idea of what's out there, but, you know, you know, it doesn't tell you everything that's going to happen to you. And I said, the truth of the matter is that, you know, you can't do that in a, in a curriculum in, in college. There's too many, too much variety. We can give you ideas. And I said, well, why didn't you get together and just think about what you could do? And they looked at each other and said, you mean solve it ourselves? <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, you know, uh, I think you could come to me. You've got enough experience. And, uh, you know, they just thought that was the craziest question in the world that I asked, you know. Uh, and finally, uh, I said, well, uh, go do it. Think about it, you know. If you have to get some books out, I hope you find them. They're not going to give you the answer, but they may give you some ideas and so forth. Uh, and I said, yeah, I never thought about that. We'll, we'll do that. Uh, and the idea, I had to go back to the, uh, the training program that was making, they wanted to look how the, how the uh, interviews go, you know, and they expected to hear everything was well, but, uh, and I said, you know, I said, we got a big hole in this program. I said, well, what's that, what's that, we covered all the content. I said, well, you know what, it's thinking, 
you know, that's what you miss thinking. And what you do, you think, I said, you know, think, you know, that you, you can think, uh, and, and you, what you have to come out with, with a paradigm, a model, by which you can solve problems you've never seen before, okay? That's what they're missing. The program thought, well, here's this uh, management problem, here's that management problem, without really emphasizing, wait a minute, these are just classes of things, you know? You may never see these. Now, how do you take this kind of problem, of which there may be many within this category, what is a way to approach it? And I said, you know, you can do it, you can think about it, you can brainstorm, and come up with that, a paradigm or an algorithm of how you think about things. And the truth is, we all do that in life. You know, I mean, when you go to college, and you know, how many times have you applied exactly what someone taught you in a classroom? No, they gave me an idea of how to handle something. Well, they were afraid to do that for one thing, which was one aspect that was missing in the program. The other is, they didn't give them enough practice in actually doing things in a sense of a variety that they could create these paradigms. So that's an example of uh, going into the classroom and having some big black holes in your teacher training program. Uh, that, in fact, should have been caught you know, in their student teaching, uh, if not in their coursework it, itself. So uh, they did change that, and everybody agreed that you know, uh, practice. And, and the reason I mention this is that I don't know hardly any other professions that meet things in the real world that you can't possibly teach in the classroom. Uh, uh, I mean, there's so much variety. You don't know what's happening from one day to another. And you have to be confident that, in fact, you can think your way through situations. And as you get more and more mature as a teacher, you get quicker and quicker about thinking about those ways. So it's, it's a learning curve. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty fast learning curve if you watch teachers out there in the student teaching situation. Uh, they pick it up pretty quick because it's their own self survival so one solution to what you're describing is to have field experiences early and often and maybe to and I, I, I understand that this is an emphasis coming from NK or some of the other agencies to, to really do away with the teacher education classroom put it out into the schools let them let them have those experiences that are early often and deep but the other thing that you're talking about is this ability to think in those situations and to think through those ideas. Is that how we get them to think about things? Is by putting them out in those field experiences early and often? Or do you have other, what other suggestions would you have for the kind of thinking that you want them to do and, and to encourage them to do and that you want them to make a, a habit? Well, we all know that the field experiences is a great motivation to think because it's a, it's a self-survival situation. That forces you to be uh, you're uncomfortable. Let's be nice about it, okay? You either stressed and you want to undo that stress. So the more you're out there in the field, the more you, you see the need to. Uh, the next step is actually, okay, what do I need to solve these kinds of problems? And this is uh, what I was talking about is the gulf between the beginning of the teacher training program and the student teaching and when you actually graduate. So wait a minute now. What kinds of behaviors can we actually do to exhibit? Uh, in a variety of situations there. And that that's those are things that need to be integrated into our teacher teacher training. The other thing that came to mind though, and, uh, uh, the earlier and the more experience, I think we'd all agree, uh, the more experience with real real kids in real classrooms, the better off you're gonna be. There's no question about it. Uh, teaching, you know, uh, is a, a service per, per se for you know, profession. So they serve, they try to serve early. We have early observations, you know, we do all those kinds of things. The truth of the matter is we actually tried another program uh, uh, where the very first uh, semester we had this notion, I just want to uh, indicate that I'm not supportive of it, uh, that the very first semester it sounds logical that you put teachers out there uh, to meet teachers and teachers in a classroom and they observe other classrooms. Uh, this in the first semester. They, they're just taking you know, education coursework, and maybe very little of it, because they really don't really get up to speed and take those courses for their junior. But, uh, uh, and th this particular program was a complete failure on our part. Uh, and the reason it was a failure is that, uh, first of all, of the teachers that were in this program that went out 
first semester at the university, observing a higher percentage than of them, and a considerably higher percent dropped out of the teaching program. Okay? Uh, they said, well, why did that happen? Well, we interviewed those, okay? And they said, you know, uh, well, I think one, one kid said, you know, it's crazy out there. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I, why would I be a teacher? I said, I, I must have been nuts to get in this program, you know? Uh, well, the, the, the concept behind this was they had no conceptualization of how to categorize and formulate what they were seeing. You know, they had no concept of direct, indirect instruction. They had no concept of these methods of teaching and so forth. But they could put things in the pigeonholes and say, okay, I'm seeing this. And it could even have been a useful instructional experience if someone said, okay, today, I want you to look for this. I want you to look for that. And the idea was immersion. Just get out there. You know, there was no teacher, educator working with them. Get out there and see what it was. Well, it just scared the hell out of you know, a, a number of them and said, you know, this is crazy, you know. Uh, but, you know, it could have been turned into a better situation had there been some, some guidance. We kind of call those the baptism of fire programs, you know. Uh, and uh, we don't have that anymore, and I don't see any more in the country, but you have to be careful about the, the, my, the reason I mentioned you have to be careful about the early experience. You know, the early experience has to be structured in ways that are connected with a particular course and a mentor and a teacher that, that can deal with that. But the answer to your question is, yeah, with uh, this with the teaching profession, the more you're in the field and you're feeling this, uh, I can think of my own first days of teaching.
teaching of uh, programs. They may have some good suggestions about the administration of the department and uh, make recommendations about, hey, you're short on faculty in this area. Those, those things are useful to hear from somebody else. But uh, where the rubber meets the road with the teachers in the classroom, uh, they're, they're not at that level. Are you okay with the move in Texas to 15 semester hours plus six hours of student teaching, a grand total of 21 credit hours to uh, in the teacher education programs in, in the Texas University? Uh, I'm not against uh, uh, the the credit hours. I'm, I'm, I, I want to be sure that they're useful in terms of what the teachers are learning. And uh, I've seen it both ways. You throw credit hours on someone and think that somehow they're going to get smarter without understanding what are the credit hours that this person needs to do that. Right. Um, I, I don't even see that the credit hours in my opinion could be different depending upon one's background, one's interest, one's teaching major, and, and so forth. So it's not just, this is again the number thing which goes back to the testing. It's like, you know, we're, we're number crazy in a way, you know, everybody said, well, we hope to the credit hours from 12 to 15, we're going to get better teachers. Uh, <laughs> it depends on what, what, what the credit hours are, who the individual is, and so forth. Uh, in some cases, they could be the best things that they have to In others, they just make it more misery for people. If you're out know, teaching, you're doing something else. Uh, uh, but I associate it with the testing in the sense that you can count that 15 is bigger than 14, right? So it's got to be better. But 14 is better than 13. It's got to be better. Uh, well, like a standardized score goes up five points. Oh, well, uh, this teacher gets paid more than some other teacher whose standardized test score didn't go up five points. But was it what this teacher did? Or did this kid study a whole lot? Or is this kid brighter? Or what, what not? Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure I made totally clear about this process notion. Uh, uh, but it's being, it's, and, and I know that you do it, uh, but the purpose is to look at the research uh, and, and see what are the critical behaviors uh, that the research has shown that are important. Uh, I mean, we know these are pat phrases that you know I use and you use, you know, the learning climate has something to do with it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the other dimensions of uh, the style of teaching, the knowledge of the kid, where they come from, and so forth. Uh, these things can be turned into observational rubrics, if you will, uh, or just check sheets. Or, uh, and, but the point is, they're instructional tools. So what I'm talking about is, when you do this process evaluation, it's part of your instruction. It's part of the instruction. It's not there for the purpose of assessing the, the, the student as much as it is to say, hey, this is a teachable moment. This is a teachable moment. This is a teachable moment. Uh, so I think that's so when I went back and tried to explain the process thing, I mean it as part integrated with, uh, and some of you would probably be good to not, you're not being polite, but you could, if you're not in your head, I would understand. So we're doing that, we're doing that, okay? Well, if you're doing it, you need to keep doing it, but, but you need to do more of it, of, you know, what are you looking for during the student teaching experience and the first year out, uh, going to visit here, uh, and to what extent is the teacher proficient in doing these kinds of behaviors uh, uh, that generally are the core of effective teaching? And not all of this. You know, we do have teachers that you know come out of the womb and are beautiful teachers. You know, I don't know the, how they do it, but you know, the tremendous personalities and they pick things up real quick. But uh, I think we need the instruction for it, uh, for this regard. Gary, tell us about your the work on your new book and where you are in your thinking and what you're what you're working on. Well, this isn't really a big like skip to a new topic because it comes just right on the heels of everything we've been talking about. Uh, my I don't know if you want to call it a conversion, but uh, uh, I just observed in classrooms enough, and I had the opportunity to do a cross cultural study. Uh, which was quite an interesting opportunity and a rare one uh, between the United States and India uh, of teacher training. Well, uh, and it came about in the most unusual way. Uh, in India, uh, there was a group of individuals who wanted to start an uh, alternative
alternative school. India does not allow private schools or alternative schools. There's only the Ministry of Education schools and also schools that are religious schools. They call them Hindu schools, but nothing in between. Uh, they wanted to try this school out. Uh, the Ministry of Education said, uh, this is too wacky, we don't let you do this, but they got some influential people in the country to talk the ministry into a trial period for the school. Basically, uh, Indian education is very strict, very uh, drill and practice, let's put it that way, very drill and practice. And they wanted, they were now watching TV in America, getting a sense of what happens in America, and they said, you know, we want to Try some of these things, you know, interactive software, collaborative, you know, collaborative learning, uh, you know, uh, 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 inquiry and problem solving. You know, they had no concept of, you know, the question of letting a kid out and solve problems. No, it's really practical. I'm going to tell you the pieces of problem solving, but you never get to do it. Well, you know, so, and they were influential in India, and they decided to start a school, an experimental school, Malakara. India, which is in the state of Kerala, which happens to be a beautiful state that's in the south that overlooks the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, the west, west side. Uh, and they, uh, they said, okay, we'll give you, uh, in India they take uh, a standardized exam in their sophomore year high school, which determines whether you can continue high school or not. If you don't, then you go off and do a trade school or get a job. Uh, and you have to take it again in your senior year, not the same test, but more proficient test. And that decides whether you can have a government job or go to a university. And those are about the only two ways you could get up into the social economic ladder there. You get to work for the government or you get a professor job. But there are only 2% that are allowed to go to school, uh, go to college. Uh, that 2% that is set because they just don't have the facilities. It's not that they arbitrarily set it, that's all the room they have, okay? Those who score very high on that test in the senior year uh, could have a possibility of chosen. Well, they said, okay, start the school, and they wanted to start with elementary school kids. And But when they get to the sophomore year, they have to pass our national exam. It's a 100-point scale test. Uh, it takes two and a half days to answer, to, to respond to. They take two and a half days to the school. <coughs> they started the school, and basically what I, I uh, and they, well, they went through, what, eight, eight years plus two years of high school. They took the test, and uh, the test is a 100-point scale. The average in the country on the test is 32. It's perfectly, it's, it's purposely set. It's a very hard test because there's only so many people who go into the government. There's only so many people who go to the university. Okay? The a average of the kids in the school, uh, uh, 60 is like meritorious. Uh, every kid in the school got 60 or higher except one. One got 58 or 59 or something like that. Well, that woke the Ministry of Education up. They didn't like it because they thought they could wipe the school off the boards because they felt there's no way the way the school was being run. But basically, if you looked at the school, you'd say, what do kids do all day? They run around the playground. Okay? That, that would be the first impression. Uh, so, I mean, how, how could these kids do this? Well, they made a promise to the school that if the kids would pass this test at the sophomore level, they'd allow the school to continue. Well, they reneged, and they said, no, uh, uh, we're going to have to ask them to pass the test in the senior year as well. Uh, well, at this point, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, got pretty suspicious of what was going on here. By the way, there was no cheating on the test scores because in uh, India, the teachers never see a test. They don't administer the test. There's no school system. A person literally comes from New Delhi. In this case, it's 800 miles away. In a suitcase with the tests, sits down, gives them, locks the test up, gets on the train, goes back. Nobody has ever seen those tests, okay? They're in a vault, okay? Uh, uh, so there was no appearance of collusion there. Well, I'm sitting in my office, uh, and these three people come in from India I never saw before, so we want to talk to you. Uh, so we've got the school out there, and we'd like you to uh, evaluate the school because it has to be evaluated, because we can't understand how these kids learn. 
They said this is unbelievable. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a curriculum, and the teachers are supposed to follow the curriculum, but there are not normal classrooms. Okay? Uh, and, you know, I, they, I thought this was a ridiculous thing, and I, I didn't, I wasn't going to do that. I read it yet, and I had no desire to go. But I happened to be reading a book about China, and uh, I was kind of struck with the fact that they said that the definition of crisis is a dangerous opportunity. It's two words, okay? And I thought to myself, oh, it's definitely dangerous. <laughs> you know, I said, you know, I've never been to India. I mean, wouldn't it be cool, you know, maybe I'll go to India and see India, you know? So, so I waited for a while. I said, okay, I, uh, I'll do it, but I'll just go for uh, a week and a half or two weeks. And at the end of that, I, the only condition I would uh, take is that if I say I don't want to do it, you will get mad. They said, no, we're not mad. Just come. Come. He said, you know, pay my trip over there. Okay. Said, yeah, okay. I went over there, uh, looked around for a week and a half. It was pretty ambivalent, you know. The kids were running around the playground, basically. It's a richly, it's a richly textured in, in, uh, educational environment. I mean, there's lots of things kids can get into. And they did have rooms, a science room, and a biology room, and a language room, and so forth. The kids could choose whether they wanted to go in there or not. And, you know, some did, some, some didn't. So, uh, finally, I went back for two years, uh, doing the evaluation of it, seeing what the teachers do, looking at the kids. Uh, I did write back a couple of times. I said, I said, when I did this, I said, the first time, I thought that I, I would, would never go back. I said, well, I suppose you want a report of some kind. Uh, and I said, how long do you want to report? Because I didn't want to waste my time. And I said, maybe just go there. And I didn't. And it didn't say anything, so I thought I'd really try out something simple, like 10 pages. And I thought I could write that on the plane going home, and that would be the end of it. Uh, well, as time went on, when I kept coming back, uh, I saw more and more of what was going on. I took my Western lens off me. And I said, Shh, these kids are running around the playground. They're learning, you know. And then I wrote it back. I said, about that 10 page report? I said, I think I had about 50 pages here. You know, they said, yeah, yeah, 50 is okay. Well, a couple of months went by, maybe a half a year, wrote back again. I said, yeah, 50 pages. I said, you know, about 60, what about 100? Can I write 100 pages? You know? <laughs> and so, because I was, you know, going around observing and taking this note, and my notebook's getting bigger, and my ideas were like, Ugh, they're getting bigger and bigger and growing, you know, in my head, and I couldn't get it done. I said, what? i got to find out what's going on here. You know, this is a little bit too much preposterous to believe. Well, I looked closely, and uh, I really saw what was going on uh, inside uh, of their heads and how this was arranged. It was a very, very clever situation. Uh, and uh, the kids were drawn in. Uh, they were given flexibility. And there were three characteristics, which uh, then I started to see in the United States. Uh, I did have a control group in the United States. It wasn't a control. It was in that program, but it was also in the United States. Uh, but. Uh, what I saw was, uh, uh, when I came back to the United States and observed in regular classrooms, other classrooms, I saw the same thing. The three things that I thought were powerful, powerful learning tools. And, uh, and I couldn't be impressed uh, uh, because they're, they're sneaky and small. One is uh, trust and confidence between the child and the teacher. Trust and confidence. In other words, the teacher always was in authority, no question there, but there was a relationship between the child and the teacher. Uh, and it was, okay, I'm safe. I'm safe with this person. Uh, she's not going to hurt me. He's not going to hurt me. Uh, this is going to be a, a partnership of sorts. Uh, and I began using the, 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 the phrase, a partnership of ideas. Okay? It's not just the teacher teaching me, because the teacher, there was one teacher for six kids, and that, that teacher followed around these kids and then promoted learning activities. If the kid didn't want it, the teacher stood back. But these were exciting things that were presented at times. Uh, so in essence, uh, they, they did this over, over, over time. And uh, I kind of looked at the situation. I said, trust and confidence. They seem what I really saw was, uh, I, and I was 
there for plenty of the U.S. classroom, uh, uh, life-giving experiences and no life-taking experiences. Uh, you know, in a school, they're kind of, you know, kids kind of get embarrassed or, you know, they get emotionally hurt sometimes, you know, inadvertently. Uh, this was a happy school, you know, and, I mean, consistently happy. Uh, uh, and the, so the trust and confidence led to that. Life-giving experiences. Every kid was enthused to contact the teacher, and the trust and confidence led to that. The second thing was uh, uh, every teacher had unconditional acceptance of the child's potential to learn. In other words, if this child gave the wrong answer ten times in a row, this this teacher did not lose hope on that kid. Uh, they would keep going and going and going. Uh, and I don't think I saw any kid that, any teacher that ultimately failed. And they've gone a long time. And in our classrooms, there are teachers, and I, I understand why, and I'd be the same way. You know, right away you pick out some kids, they're, you like them, you know, they learn. Uh, your your self-esteem is bolstered by them. They're happy, they like you, they do well on their tests, and there are others that are in the middle, and then there are others that, oh God, I wish you wouldn't in my test. I wish it was, wasn't in my class, you know? Uh, and that affects your behavior. And that child knows it, and you know it. But you've got so many other people to be, deal with, you're not gonna, you don't worry about it. Here, in this case, I never saw a case in which a teacher would give up on a kid regardless of that kid's learning ability. And ultimately saw many times that it actually worked. So it was uncondi unconditional acceptance of the child potential learning. That didn't mean unconditional acceptance of the child. The child is hurting someone else or something like that. This had to do with the potential to learn. Unconditional acceptance, never fail. And the third characteristic was the winning ingredient of the school was exploration and discovery. In other words, the child, now I understood the playground. Now I understood the, the richly textured environment. Ex exploration and discovery. What do you need to explore and discover? You need things to play with. You need things to work with. You need things to discover, to explore, okay? And this was set up to force kids to explore and discover and go beyond the teacher. In other words, if you don't find a struggle, you're not learning, okay? But now, I look back at the first two, trust and confidence and unconditional acceptance of the ability to learn. That's what you need to push yourself to explore because if you fall on your face, you'll accept that and do it again. But if you don't have the trust and the confidence, and you know the teacher doesn't have unconditional acceptance and your potential to learn, you don't do that. So those were there to keep pushing the kids, pushing the kids, pushing the kids, and there were higher and higher things to do, and the teacher was there, and they did it, okay? They weren't scared because they weren't going to, if they fell on their face, uh, going over their head, then nothing was going to happen to them. Uh, well, then I, I began to see in some good classrooms in the United States, I saw that those, those things also did reappear in themselves. And those were three of the most important. Now, they can see that was all the way around. Uh, oh, I love that journey. You, 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 know, you, know, you, know, you know what? Then I'm starting to think this is, this is a form of constructivism. What is constructivism? Mm -hmm. You start with the kid, okay? So you start with a playground bunch of, a bunch of Richly textured materials and biology rooms, uh, physics rooms, chemistry rooms, and you could go, you could go play you're crazy. You go in there, okay? And they had a teacher that would be there, not drill and practice testing them, but you know, there, pushing them on, helping them. They were called they weren't even called teachers; they called resource people, okay? But they were trained teachers. So, uh, in the end, uh, uh, this turned out to be. Very favorable situation, which I saw then coming back in some classrooms in the United States. A little harder to pull off here in terms of the space and so forth. Uh, okay, so uh, started to ring a bell in my head. You know, like okay, this I think a lot of people invented the term at the same time. But they're constructing things in their head. They're not, uh, and the purpose here is not to put things in the kid's head which I think we do need, you know, there is, there is, there is some beauty to drill practice or some need to, okay? I think we drive 
into insanity sometimes. You know, we don't have anything else but trailer, right? But you put it into it, the, the, the kids had it. Okay, but now you you need them to think. Uh, and uh, like my teachers in Houston, you need them to think. And how do you do that? You have to explore and discover and feel that if you fall on your face, hey, you just get up and try again. Okay, why? Trust and confidence, unconditional acceptance of the potential, no matter how, uh, how many times you have to, have to try. So I'm thinking about constructivism, uh, starting with the kid. Uh, this is one form of starting with the kid. Uh, and so I basically use that as a model that uh, the Indian and its counterpart in the United States, and uh, try to put it in the American perspective. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how, how it would work in the United States. Uh, uh, took it out of that geography. Uh, I wrote my report there, and they, they wrote a book up and put it into a book form, but that's, for, that's describing the Indian school. That is the kind of, that their school system set up totally different. So when, I, when uh, you wrote and said, come to this conference, which I uh, don't usually do, but you know, uh, it's a nice invitation, I said, you know, he may not like me and he doesn't know who I am. So <laughs> I, I, said, I said, you know, I'm a little bit far out here. So I sent him the first couple of chapters to this book and I said, and then I waited, waited for him to come back. I said, you know, I didn't you know, read this. And the guys, the guys, you know, this is a Hey, Gary, I'm a gambler. <laughs> <laughs> so I put that in the, in the American context so that people can use it. So I'm not finished. But it's almost there. So let me ask you just one last quick question, and then we'll open it up for, for, for discussion. But Gary, how does the, the insights that you that you discovered that when you were doing this watching in India, how does that jive with what you were saying at the outset of your talk? that there are these practices that we know and that research has verified certain things. Is the research that you were talking about at the beginning of the talk related to those three things or is this a, a new insight, a more fundamental insight? What is the uh, relationship there? They're related. I don't know if you want me to take the time to tell you another story. Mm -hmm. but, you know, um, uh, it's probably the only way to answer your question. Okay. They, they are related. Uh, uh, I was finishing my my report uh, for India, and I had some pretty hard days. By the way, you know, I like, took a semester off of teaching, and I just was on the bed for, for a semester writing this. You know, uh, wonder, you know, if it's going to make any sense or whatnot. Uh, and I had the story I thought that was convincing and true, uh, but I didn't have. This was me, you know, there was nothing outside of me in this book that said this was right. Uh, and that was a problem. And there was some serendipity struck. Uh, I, a friend called me and said, let's go meet and have lunch together at a place where faculty eat lunch. I don't even go there. Uh, uh, and uh, he went to talk to me about some grand deep writing. I said, okay, I'll get there. And then he called and while I was there already, he said, I can't come. It was crowded, there was only one table where I sat down. This big guy who sits down next to me. You know, I don't talk much, I'm not a conversationalist. And, but he was. I mean, he said, What do you do? You know, I said, Well, you know, I, you know I'm a little timid. I'm over in the college education, college education, a little bit of a total hole. You can see that. You know, with, with a big, big hard side. What are you working on? So, 
and I've got this project in India. I said, I think I've got it all understood how this works, but I don't have, I'm not confident about it. I don't have anything outside that ever shows that things work this way. He said, well, tell me about the project. I said, well, I've got these kids there, and they run around, and they do this uh, stuff, and uh, uh, they kind of uh, learn by exploration and discovery, and there's uh, you know, trust and confidence, and unconditional potential to learn. Uh, and uh, I said, they, they, the whole thing is set up so that they push the kids into exploration and discovery. So they're piecing together, not like the teachers that use them, they have to piece together an answer to it. If they don't get it the, the first time, they're not downhearted, okay? They'll do it again. So instead of being told what to do, they realize it. They realize it for themselves, okay? Big difference. Teacher teaches you something, you forget it. You realize it, it stays inside. I had to memorize the names of the presidents in fifth grade, uh, worked three weeks to memorize it, and so help me, I forgot that two weeks later, once I got to the sign, okay? Uh, so, uh, I said, okay, I've got this, it, they do this exploratory, they do this exploration discovery. He said, well, that sounds like what I'm working on, which I felt was in the last four weeks, and what's the similarity? <laughs> 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 you know, I thought he was just trying to be nice and get rid of me I said, what, 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 do you, what do you mean? He said, well, I study how lower life forms grow into higher life forms. I said, it's like your kids. How do, they, how do they move to the next step of the learning lab? They have exploration, discovery, then they go on to the next level because they're not down hard and hard, even if they didn't make it that time. They have trust and confidence and potential to learn behind them. Uh, and they said, I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, uh, we, we did that. That's just like your kids. We put lower life forms into an environment, and we want them down to grow into higher life forms. We're studying how do you get to a higher life form. And uh, we did, you know, something that uh, kind of reminds me of what you did. He said, we, we give them some struggle. That's how we here, too, with the struggle move to a higher level. And I, we don't want a struggle that's so great that, you know, it, it harms us or even that it deters us from taking another step. Uh, this hard enough. But the struggle is important. The struggle at the right level at the right time. So we put them in there and we, we gave them a struggle. And I said, what happened? He said, they all died. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. Uh, I was getting interested in this, and then, you know, I think this guy's a crackpot, you know. Um, and he said, it wasn't unlike, you, you, it was unlike what you did in, in, in India. I said, well, I said, how did that happen? I said, well, he said, you let them choose what their struggle is. In other words, the teacher didn't say, okay, guys, girls, we're all going to do this project today. No, it's a richly textured environment that they could choose what they wanted to do. They could build things, they could go to chemistry, they could go to foreign language, they could do all these different classes, bring it out. It was where they had a growth edge, so to speak. A growth edge is where in a tree, you see the growth come off one side because the sun shines you know, on, it, on it. That's the natural way in which that, that, that growth is going. That, so these kids would choose that, that, that way. He said, we didn't know to do that. And, and what happens is that then we went and changed the environment of these lower life forms so that there was a variety of ways in which we could create a struggle. Not everyone did, did, didn't have to do the same struggle. And they could choose which was comfortable to their biological makeup, if you will, or whatever. I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about at this point, but uh, inside them, uh, they could cling to, to that and move up to the higher level. And I said, wow. I said, oh, that's what my kids do. They go on a struggle. Uh, they go to the next highest level struggle out there in, the, in India. Uh, and then I'm looking at this guy. And uh, I don't know, it looks familiar, but I never met him. And I realized that I saw a picture of him in the student newspaper. And I said, who, who are you? He said, I, I am Predigini. And Ira 
Greta Jeannie, I asked a few more questions, won the Nobel Prize for chemistry and physics in a topic called dissipative structures. And I said, whoa. I just said, this is a golden egg. You know, I mean, yes, I can cite you in my study. <laughs> I said, and I said, you know, but I won't be able to read your journal articles. <laughs> he said, he said, no matter. He said, pick up a Time magazine or a Newsweek magazine. It's all in there. You know, <laughs> all in there babies. You know, <laughs> and sure enough, you know, he had just won that Nobel Prize. So that was my savior. That you know, it wasn't just Gary did this. You know, and, uh, it linked to something larger. And I found some related literature that he. So, I, that's the, I a bit okay, but that's the link. That's, you know, fair enough, uh, fair enough. It's, it's a link that, it's, it's the link that goes back to the process I was talking about. How do you get those test scores there? If there's an intermediate process of struggle, of, of, and then the assessment that I'm talking about that finally gets them to that level. And that struggle is different for individuals. Uh, that's not, that doesn't have to be the same struggle for this student teacher or for that student struggle. That student teacher. Good. Gary, that's, that's terrific. We have, we have a few minutes left. Is somebody sitting with a burning question that they would like? The first hand and then the second hand. So we probably have time for at least those two. I'm curious about the school in India. I know that Ray Montessori spent a number of years in India when she was exiled from Italy way back when. Some of the things that you talk about make me think about the Montessori approach. So I'm curious if there was any influence that you're aware of of that school and the time she spent there. Of the Montessori school? Yes. It's very well thought of, uh, and I've talked to people who have been there, and uh, some of the same ideas come up in just what I've described. She has her own, you know, uh, it's a little bit more of an of a, of a early skill development program. <laughs> Uh, where this is not, this allows the child to get those skills when developmentally that skill uh, is ready to be learned. So in India, there could be some kids that are reading at the second grade, grade level, but they'll be in sixth grade level in science. Uh, uh, they have to stay in the school for a long period of time. It's not something you can bring your kid to. So the kid has to find that struggle, find that readiness uh, to do it. Uh, what I forgot to say is that how that links to the constructivism, uh, that was the basis for writing the constructivist book. I said, okay, uh, how do we do that in our U.S. schools in a way that has to fit the, the classroom, lots of things are different, teacher training is different and so forth. But I said, okay, if I could put this in an American context, uh, we could have some of those same results in the classroom that they get over there. Uh, yeah, it was Yes, Kathy Carter, University of Arizona. I met you, Gary, in 1982 in Austin, Texas, when I was there working for the Feds. And several of your colleagues, Dave Berliner, uh, Walter Doyle, and Gary Griffin, I've written with over the years. I feel like I've seen an old friend again, so it's so nice to see you. Um, I was thinking about many of your comments, and one of the things that strikes me is that at the start of your presentation, you were sort of lamenting that we weren't still involved in this sort of process product paradigm, focusing on the process. Um, and so it seems to me we have evolved as teacher education and research to a sort of higher form. So there are things we do like critical pedagogy, trying to talk about that, trying to talk about funds of knowledge and cultural exchange in classrooms, constructivist learning. I'm so glad to look forward to your book. Uh, narrative inquiry, action research, and all of those things. So it seems to me that the end of your story, we depart a bit about. I think that we have evolved in teacher education to study teaching, so we get a much richer picture, the one that you're writing about now, of kids as being active agents in their learning, trying to consider their cultural backgrounds, their sort of difference, if you will. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on any of those uh, research agendas, well, narrative inquiry, yeah, case-based education. Yeah, I didn't mean to, I just got so caught up in this other sure. story. Uh, uh, yes, those are the kinds of tools uh, that you talk about that have been in the background but now are coming to the fore. 
uh, ways of collecting the information. Uh, uh, the thing that needs to be done, though, and the reason I didn't probably think of it, and, uh, it is we need them embedded in and maybe where you are embedded in the teacher training process. Uh, uh, not just tools for research, for example, which uh, they are, okay? But now take those, and that's the, those are the process tools that I'm talking about, okay? And then take those and say, okay, now how does that, how does that help us in uh, the teacher training experience, the student teaching experience? Put it back into pedagogy as opposed to just methodology, and I think, you know, in, in some experimental settings that that has, that has happened. Mm -hmm. I think that is the window of the future, basically, what you described. We'll go, go through those again so everybody can. Uh, and I mentioned case-based pedagogies. Yeah. Lee and Judy Shulman did work with that for a long time. I did some work. Okay, stop there. Take the case-based <laughs> study, we look at it, and now what does that teacher need to know about that case-based study? I mean, you collect it, bring it back. Name the next one. Uh, let's see, what else do I talk about? Critical pedagogy. Okay, critical pedagogy, okay. The teacher, you know, you, you collect information about the critical pedagogy. The step now is how do we integrate that into the teacher training curriculum so that they know about that and they can use that. So that's the, that's the edge that I'm looking for of how we make, how we make those tools useful for making the teacher, and I'm going to use the word, realize realize something and not just told something, not just memorize something, but realize, ah, I have a concept. I have a concept now. So not like my teachers in Houston, okay? They keep looking for the pieces. They said, I got the concept of it. Of it. And those are the tools that can do that. Nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. A question back here and then we'll, we'll go there and that might be all. We'll see. So like your text, Some do and some don't, but 
that gives you instruments, actually, that the, uh, the, the, the teacher, uh, student teacher, uses to observe other teachers, uh, to put those concepts that are in the book that you're referring to, real, to make them real, to actually help observe and get acuity as to what they're seeing out there in each of the 10, 12 uh, fact, dimensions of effective teaching. A checklist, and you can take the form out, it's perforated, you can bring it into the classroom, and then you, someone like you, look at it and say, what do you see in front of them? Yes. I was just curious how, um, you said that you've seen nuggets or the essence of what you saw in India and other places in the United States that gave you hope that there are, in fact, ways that this could happen. Were any of those in partnership or in relationship with informal education institutions like museums, science centers, the Exploratorium, Science Museum of Minnesota, or any of those? Did you see a linkage of community-based? I, 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 see, I see the possibility of a linkage. Personally, I did not do that. Where I saw them the most were in charter schools uh, and in uh, uh, some experimental schools, uh, uh, private schools. Private schools and charter schools uh, almost instinctively fall into this mode. Uh, they have smaller class size, though, where it's not, you know, it's a little bit of money thing, too. Uh, uh, so I, I, see, I see that coming. And, but I don't want to give, uh, uh, I, want, I want to give credit to regular classroom teachers, too, because you can see these things in spurts and moments where there are opportunities. Uh, a good classroom teacher will do just exactly what we're talking about here. It just so happens that there's a big administrative system there you have to get through and you've got, you know, one hand tied behind your back sometimes in terms of time and materials and so forth and the way the room is set up. But uh, I think any good teacher, when the moment is there, they naturally will fall into a constructivist mode, uh, uh, exploration and discovery mode. And they're, doing, they're finding opportunities more and more to do that. You find that even in the guides that teachers use in the, for textbook guides and so forth. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't work in other uh, private sectors. Gary, can we trouble you for one more question? Sure. Okay. Okay, so years ago I took a philosophy of education class after I took a couple of Ed Sci classes. And in that philosophy of education class, I had a chance to read some of Jerome Bruner's work, in particular Beyond the Information Given, and a little bit about Rousseau. So when you were just talking about your three factor model, which had to do with discovery on it, right, relative to yeah. your studies in India, I was wondering how what you were observing in India was any different than what Bruner was proposing many moons ago in the United States, and Rousseau even further back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all there. <laughs> it's all there. Uh, it's not stated, you know, quite the same way, but uh, if you're sharp enough, you're going to see that these themes have run through uh, uh, the American educational literature. I, if, you, if, you, if you had to play back what I said, and you had John Dewey in mind. Exploration and discovery. It, it, learning by experience, okay? Thank you. Uh, Zone of development. Yeah, Abraham Camplin, okay? Uh, uh, talks about teachable moments and, you know, realization, okay? Uh, uh, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are others as well. Yeah, it's there. Uh, yeah. So if we've neglected them before, why won't we neglect them again? I think the whole, the whole was missing. You know, you read it and it's, it's a piecemeal. I think now we have a setting. I'd love to go back and, you know, retrace all those steps to make the point that you, I think can be made is that uh, I don't think we saw education. We, don't, we didn't see the need in one solid context. Uh, this is the teacher. We have troubles. Uh, we've got to teach these people in classrooms. Uh, education has kind of got so big and sophisticated that we've got something to apply it to. There it was a nifty idea and uh, there wasn't much wiggle room for the way schools were a hundred years ago. Uh, not much creativity about it, but I think they were ahead of their time in bringing those things up. Because they said, you know, some, at some point these things are going to be applicable, and I think they are. So I make no claim that anything is original, as I mentioned, uh, uh, 
uh, it's, it was there. I, I put it in a contact, twisted it, you know, made it work. Uh, but uh, no, uh, I mean John Dewey. I mean, I, you know, that's a piece of John Dewey. Uh, it's a, uh, actually, Carl Rogers. Where'd you get trust and confidence? Okay, where did you get trust and confidence from? Carl Rogers made it famous. He said, "Listen, if I'm if I'm giving psychotherapy to someone and I don't have trust and confidence, if they don't trust me, then I'm not going to hurt them." I'm not going to say something bad. I'm not going to tell my neighbor what you just said, even though it's funny and interesting or whatnot. And just the reverse, okay? Uh, that they're not going to go out and talk about Carl Rogers, you know, what a crazy guy this is, or what a trust and confidence. He knew he wasn't going to get off a dime unless he did that. And he spent most of his life beating on that theme and showing how it could be done. So uh, Carl Rogers and certainly John Dewey, uh, Abraham Kaplan. There too. You know, you know though that the people in India didn't know who these people yeah. were. <laughs> they, 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 they when shit when it says something about us, they say our universal ideas. They can come up independently all over the world. Uh, but once they saw the ideas, uh, when I gave my final report back, you know, they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and that came from uh, a lot of uh, honestly Hindu theory. Uh, uh, plays a role in early, uh, 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 you know, stuff that came from. Uh, I had to read some of it because it was this, this program in India was in a Hindu setting, uh, and the inspiration for it came from a guy named uh, Guru Dev, which was a uh, sage. And uh, I asked him, I said, "Why did you start this school? Or how did you?" He didn't start it himself, but he gave ideas for it, and he sent me to. Uh, the Upanishads and some other readings, the 2000 BC, which was not easy to you know, <laughs> read. I, I, you know, he said, you'll find it in there. I'd read 300 pages, and I didn't see anything. He said, read another 300. You know? <laughs> uh, but they were there. So it, it not, goes back even before Dewey and yeah, Abraham Kaplan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in thanking you?